one. This is our first one. Uh, next speakers here. Uh, two of them are like today's speaker. So both are women, uh, and I'm really happy like women cloud native is increasing nowadays, and they are they will share us the really nice insights on the one of the thing which you must have must, you must have thought somewhere in your <laughs> uh, daily life. Like why should we learn the Kubernetes? Is it worth learning Kubernetes? So yeah, hello. So. <laughs> So let's go and welcome the Vinucha Khatode and uh, Sarangan Ambia. They will share the insights on the cube. Hello everyone. This is our first talk, so we are a little nervous over here. And uh, today we are here to talk about this buzz orchestration tool, which is gaining uh, a lot of attention over the past few years as a very remarkable technology, which is Kubernetes, yes. And uh, and uh, we are here to discuss: Is it still relevant in 2023? Like it's been there since a long time ago, and it's been uh, remarkable since well, last few years. So is it still like uh, relevant to work? And is it still worth learning Kubernetes in 2023? Let's start. And uh, let me introduce us uh, first. So myself, Vinuja Khatode. I'm currently working as DevOps engineer at numbelbox.ai uh, and I've also been recently appointed as one of the four uh, ambassadors by solo.io for the new uh, ambassador program uh, and I love to contribute to open source and engage in communities. Yeah, and I'll ask Sharanya to introduce her. Hi guys, how are you all? <laughs> nice interactive crowd. So, hi, I'm Sharanya. Uh, I am working as a software engineer at LTI Mindtree. So, my work primarily there includes uh, business analysis to software development. Uh, apart from that, I'm also interested in DevOps and product management. So, I first forayed into DevOps when uh, back in 2020 when the lockdown had just started and I wanted to explore what other paths are there, what other options are there for me in the industry. And Kubernetes was one of the first tools that I uh, got introduced to and very hard it was to learn and understand it at that point of time. So that was back in 2020 when I learned about Kubernetes and this is 2023. So is it even worth learning in 2023, three years later? That's what we are about to see. So I'll hand over the mic to Vinoza. So this is the agenda for today's talk. We'll walk you through over all of these topics. And uh, we'll start with the very first thing that comes to our mind, like why are we even asking this question? Like how, how relevant is to ask this question in, for today? Like, let's see, is it because Kubernetes is complex? No, right? Crash loop back off. <laughs> and let's explain Kubernetes what I tried and then uh, this happened with me. So... <laughs> <laughs> so let's try again today. Um, so, like, what is Kubernetes? It is an orchestration tool. What is an orchestration tool? Basically, an orchestration tool is a system to manage and deploy the containerized applications. What are containers? Containers are a small package where you can uh, make a package of your application and their dependencies and it allows, uh, container allows them to be easily shipped, to be uh, shipped anywhere and run on any system. Uh, talking about Kubernetes, like it is, op it was, uh, it is an open source platform and it was originally developed by Google and it was used in production since 2020, 2015 by Google and but now for as of today's date it is being handled by community completely uh, google does not like i don't know if it interferes or not um, and uh, it has a lot of features uh, for uh, to offer to developers which can help developers build deploy and manage their application and scale their applications with it features like automation and uh, automation like uh, kubernetes helps us automate a lot of things 
and uh, it has self healing if like self healing means if your pod goes down it uh, brings back uh, the pods uh, automatically and then we have horizontal scaling or auto scaling like whenever we need to scale our applications then kubernetes will find the nodes uh, and schedule them and like proper scale them and we also have service discovery and a lot of the other features and uh, also it is uh, like highly scalable and highly flexible as a lot of companies like from large to small companies are using Kubernetes in their architecture uh, as of now. And as I said, it is by, uh, handled by community completely. It has a large and uh, a huge active community and uh, Kubernetes has a lot of contributors uh, contributing to Kubernetes as it's an open source platform, it's an open source tool. So let's start with like go with the what is architecture, how does Kubernetes actually work. Uh, I'll hand over to Sharanya to see the Kubernetes architecture. It is divided into two planes, the control plane and the worker plane. So the control plane, it consists of the master node in which the API server, schedulers, controller manager and etcd, these are the main uh, components, these are the components of uh, the master node and then you can see in the worker node where it has uh, ports in which there are docker containers running inside it then the container runtime kubelet and kube proxy services so we will go into uh, both the nodes one by one so that we can understand it better so the developer provides the yaml file to the api server what the api server does is it is the main brain of the kubernetes okay so um, one second so uh, where was yeah so API server is the main brain of the Kubernetes. Whatever you want to talk to, you do it with the API server. And uh, the etcd, it is the key value database for the clusters. So only API server writes to it. All the other components, if they want to communicate, they communicate with the API server. The next component, that is the scheduler. So the scheduler, what it does, it, it finds the best fit node. For, your, for running your pod. And once it finds the best fit node for running your pod, it contacts the kubelet, okay? And uh, it contacts the kubelet. I'll come, come back to the controller manager. First, we'll uh, go into the worker node. So as I said, it has pods. You can see that it can have any number of pods, uh, any number of uh, containers. containers, thank you. <laughs> any number of containers inside the pods. Uh, then, the next part is kubelet. What the kubelet uh, does is, as soon as the scheduler assigns a node to the pod, it takes on the assignment and it gets the pod running. Then the next one is kube proxy. The next one is kube proxy. It maintains the network rules for the um, node. And uh, the next part yeah. is container runtime is needed so that uh, the kubelet can launch the pod pods and their containers inside it properly. Then further, as I said, um, the developer accesses, provides a YAML file, it goes inside into the master node, contacts the API server, goes to the uh, etcd, and then the scheduler, scheduler goes to the kubelet, then it uh, uh, runs the pods, and then it goes to the controller manager. So what the controller manager does is, it is responsible for uh, tracking whether the actual state and the desired state, whether they both whether both of them are same or not. Okay, you can see uh, the Kubernetes being used in Spotify, where wherever microservices are being used, you can see those being used. The Kubernetes <coughs> being used there. Uh, if you want to learn more about which apps use Kubernetes, then you can go to Kubernetes website. There you will find many case studies of uh, various apps. Uh, which have which previously used to use some other orchestration tool and they have migrated to Kubernetes after that. Then, so I'm pretty sure that now you know where the application resides. So, when should you be using Kubernetes? What is the exact time to start using Kubernetes? Uh, obviously, if you're just deploying a blog then Kubernetes, using Kubernetes is not a good idea. But if you have uh, microservices, if you want to orchestrate something, if you want to communicate between uh, clusters or you want to uh, scale your containers up or down, then using Kubernetes is obviously the best idea. Uh, it also depends upon your use case. 
We all have been there. We all have tried to install Kubernetes from scratch and it has been hard. <laughs> yeah, we all have felt the pain. So, uh, for that, we have managed Kubernetes services depending on your requirements, uh, what are pricing uh, priorities you have, uh, how do you want to deploy it. You can use the Kubernetes services, managed Kubernetes services available in the market. These are some of the examples that I have written here, uh, AWS EKS, AKS and GKE. These are the pros and cons of uh, the services that are already being used in the market. It uh, totally depends on the company, whether you're a startup or you're an MNC, which kind of service you want to go with, or do you want to use Kubernetes itself? Yeah, so to talk about the numbers and why even are we talking about this topic in the first place, I'll hand over to Vimaja from. So uh, here you can see on the screen, it's a, it's an, it's a graph. Uh, and this is survey. This was a survey which was conducted by Datadog, and here uh, the this graph depicts the Kubernetes share among the container organizations, like organizations who are using container in their architecture, and uh, how 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 much percentage of organizations are using uh, Kubernetes in their architecture. So basically, you can see over here uh, today, as of as of today, around the 50% of the organizations are using Kubernetes in their architecture. Where you can see in January 2020, like from around 38% uh, and to till July 2022, its ha graph has uh, risen to like around 50% of usage of Kubernetes in like. Uh, uh, by container organizations and uh, we believe that uh, it's only going to rise. Uh, the next survey is by Cloud Native Computing Foundation, CNCF and also the Linux Foundation are combined. Uh, it basically says that the 96% of the, the respondents, the respondents of the survey are either using Kubernetes in their architecture or either evaluating Kubernetes. So evaluating means or piloting means that they are trying to use Kubernetes in their architecture. They are experimenting with it. And this survey has end users and non end users. End users meaning the organizations or the clients or the respondents who are using cloud native applications actively in their architecture or in their ecosystem. And non end users basically means who are not actively using cloud native uh, applications in their ecosystem. So basically, this 96% per of the respondents who are using Kubernetes has end users and non end users. Among those end users, 64% of, 64 of organizations are using uh, Kubernetes in production, and 25% are piloting. I mean, they are experimenting with Kubernetes for their uh, production. And among the non end users, 49% of the organizations are using Kubernetes, are actively using Kubernetes for their uh, as, a, as their orchestration tool in their production and 20% are piloting. I hope you understand the percentages. By this we are meaning to say the uh, organizations who are not even into like cloud native space are also using Kubernetes. So you can see how much scope you have over here. Okay. The next, uh, this is the same uh, survey by CNCF. This basically tells you that uh, there are three categories of the organizations who were respondents. First was the one who were using Kubernetes very actively in their production, like their whole architecture, their whole orchestration tool is Kubernetes only. The second category is like who are using Kubernetes for very few tasks in their production, but they are using in their production. And the third category is they are trying to use Kubernetes in their production. So those who are using, who are actively using are 
they are saying that they have a uh, difficulty in finding right kubernetes talent or like right kubernetes skill to like actually have hands on and uh, manage their kubernetes on their production and 41% of the people who are uh, using kubernetes for few tasks in their uh, production are 41% uh, are they are also facing the same difficulty of uh, kubernetes skill not able to finding right kubernetes skill and uh, the highest is the 44 percent which are the companies who are trying to uh, use kubernetes in their production which is like uh, who are piloting towards the kubernetes in for their production it's like 44 percent they are not able to find right kubernetes talent <laughs> and this next survey is by uh, evaluator group which is conducted in uh, which was conducted in september 2022 which is a very recent survey and uh, you can you can see over here the first graph which actually says that which actually goes up to 55 percent says that they are having difficulty in uh, to find the expertise to manage the kubernetes with their current staff whatever the staff have they have difficulty with that staff and around uh, 80 38 percent of the uh, clients or the respondents are saying that they are not able to find a uh, Kubernetes talent outside the uh, organization. So basically what uh, some companies do like what some organizations do is they try to outsource Kubernetes talent to build in source app uh, inbuilt apps or something uh, or they try to like automate the uh, automate the things and uh, yeah, they do. They actually find uh, people from open source who are contributing to open source projects, who are contributing to Kubernetes to work in their organizations or like freelance them. Yeah, and if you are trying to like go trans transition into DevOps or like you want to get into DevOps as a fresher, uh, we feel this is the right time and you should bridge this gap, bridge this talent gap because uh, this is uh, how I just I told just how I told. Uh, the companies are trying to bridge this talent gap because uh, once you get in DevOps, like your uh, roles will consist a lot of Kubernetes. If that organization is using Kubernetes for the as orchestration tools for their architecture, so uh, you have to create clusters with in Kubernetes, like as per the requirements of if you want to scale or if you want to create a whole new staging environment or something like that. And then uh, if you are creating clusters, you have to deploy services on that. Like you have to deploy workload services, ingress to like publicly, to make that application publicly accessible uh, over the internet. And to deploy those services, those workloads, you have to write Terraform or YML codes or any uh, infrastructure, infrastructure as a code for like uh, building up the creating of the uh, infrastructure to create the configuration. And for that, you'll also have to create CI/CD in case you are pushing a new code into your GitHub. You do not actually want to like manually go and update your application every time, like create a new image and then uh, push that to prod or something. You, I'm sorry about that. Uh, you'll you'll create a CI/CD or pipeline which automatically does all of these things. And then once you have created CI/CD, and then you'll also have an observability. observability where you'll have to check the things if uh, things are going smooth, the pipelines are running smooth and uh, all of these things are like uh, are like uh, compulsory for DevOps and uh, there's also this fun fact that a lot of other things will actually come to you and you'll have to do it that we cannot even list them over here. So this is a very like big uh, discussion. We can have a separate session over this. Like this cannot be like uh, explained in a whole like two or five minutes. And yeah, like that's how you that's that now we know that that's how we have to learn uh, Kubernetes. And here are some resources to learn Kubernetes. And I these are some free YouTube channels who are uh, by. Uh, very big personalities in DevOps world who are uh, doing really good out there like with open source and DevOps as well. So uh, you can, these are the free YouTube channels, they have whole uh, DevOps, what to say, roadmaps and everything. 
and these are some learning portals you can like go from zero to hero kind of courses where you can uh, actually learn from devops from zero and go at a uh, one level up i hope everyone has taken a picture And uh, we also have Kubernetes certifications, which some companies demand, and it's good to have when you have to showcase your skills that you have like uh, done certifications. That how much you know Kubernetes, like make you need to validate your learnings or something. Like this is the first one is a basic one, which is uh, certified Kubernetes administrator. It is it is it is for like system admins and DevOps engineers. Uh, freshers also can do this. The next level of this certification is certified Kubernetes application developer, which uh, has the syllabus of uh, like CKA, and it also has cloud native. So it's a combination of both. And the next one is the there are a lot of certifications. Uh, by the way, these are just three I have listed over here, and uh, the. <coughs> The security one is the specialized uh, certification which you can do when you are more interested into security or something like you wanna uh, have a specified particularly security uh, specialist certificates in Kubernetes. And these are some more resources to explore KS. The first one is the Cube Tools where you can have a list of uh, all of the Kubernetes tools, open source to open source tools or uh, whatever tools that are being used uh, and with Kubernetes. So you can find out a list of uh, all those tools over here. And the next is the DevOps community by Rohit Ghumre, which has all of the resources, resources by uh, for DevOps, which you can search for. Like You just have to go to a GitHub and you will see everything over there. And the next is the Kubernetes user case studies. This is basically a page from uh, official Kubernetes page. It basically tells you the how many start leading startups or how many organizations uh, are using Kubernetes in their architecture and how they are using and how they adopted Kubernetes from uh, whatever orchestration tool they were using before. Uh, I hope you have taken a screenshot for this as well. I mean, taken a photo of. You can scan. Yeah, or you can directly scan. We can wait. Or we will share the slides. Yeah, sure. Excuse me, I have a question. Can you be elaborate a bit more on the observability part? I think we can. Uh, we should complete the uh, session first, and then we can have the observability or Q and A session later because we have uh, other sessions aligned. Thank you. And the, these are some uh, other orchestrators available uh, if you don't want to use like Kubernetes if it's complex for you. And then it's like uh, it's Docker Swarm and Nomad are basically lightweight uh, uh, lightweight orchestration tools that are available. Which where if you want if you do not want to scale your applications to a a very higher level and if just it's a very small like it everyone has its own pros and cons like you can uh, we, we can share the slides with you you can read more about it over the internet as well um, so yeah once you're done learning kubernetes now we know what is next so you don't do oh shit <laughs> <laughs> okay yeah, because learning Kubernetes never stops, it never completes, everything comes up like in anything. Um, so yeah, if you are like getting, preparing for interviews, so this should be you. Um, yeah, so we can connect, these are our uh, Twitter handles, LinkedIn handles. Uh, let's connect and have a conversation about this or discuss. Yeah, yeah. <coughs> yeah, sure. And uh, thank you for attending this session and hope you stay through Crash Bug Loop while learning Kubernetes is very uh, good. You can explain them also like Crash Loop back of uh, error is what it, what it is and when it comes. Like, yeah. In a in a state right now, they need to reach Crash Bug Loop. <laughs> yeah, it's basically, basically <laughs> like learning. They are still at the point if they want to learn or not. If you tell the end, right? Well, they need to crash. <laughs>
That's a feeling you should have. You should also, be, also. You should be here for 20 hours. <laughs> One minute. Uh, if you have the Q&A, you can, uh, you can ask me. Yeah, like, so I can uh, address you about observability concerns. So you can ask me. I have a session which will uh, cover the observability part. Okay. Anyone has a question? Please applause for the uh, <laughs> Thank you.